Fire, floods, earthquakes and storms. A display of a most disastrous wrath of which only nature and the gods are capable of. Erupting volcanoes raining down on cities like hell from above. Cyclones tearing farms apart. Pure destruction wiping out everything in its path. Why must such adversities exist, the affected might ask, as their lives go from safe to struggle in a brief window of time. If a vote were to be held among the citizens of Tamriel, you'd be hard pressed to find anyone who wouldn't choose to remove such tragedies from the realm of possibility. We can't blame them, but I do know of one individual, an outlier of society, who would want such destruction to stay. His unconventional way of thinking makes him a much more interesting character to meet, but perhaps not one you'd want to meet if you're standing between between him and his radical pursuits. What's going on ladies and gentlemen, my name is Michael and today I'm excited to introduce you to our latest Skyrim build, Dagon's Disciple. This is an Ultima of extreme intellect and an unorthodox worldview. Unlike most, he actually relishes in the damaging occurrences I've just described, possessing not only vast amounts of knowledge but very importantly, a burning passion to embrace all tests of the universe and the changes they lead to. This passion doesn't just include tests of nature but actually spans far beyond, more so involving the interactions of the mortal realm and oblivion, and of course, the many micro and macro political challenges faced on the continent of Tamriel itself. While many cultures consider Mehrun's Dagon a mere god of betrayal and bloodshed, Dagon's disciple has come to understand him more holistically, worshipping him not just as the prince of destruction, energy and ambition, but also as the prince of revolution and change. Looking like a Sith Lord from Knights of the Old Republic, Dagon's disciple fights his foes like the Oblivion Crisis itself, showering the battlefield with fiery blasts while unleashing hordes of aggressive Daedra upon the mortal realm. He's also an experimental alchemist, and loves to buff himself with a mix of potent concoctions. I am a massive fan of this build, and I'm very keen to share his philosophies and role-playing with you all. I'm sure you'll really enjoy it. As always, timestamps can be found in the description to help you navigate to different sections of the build after you've finished watching it, in case you want to go back and remember any details again. Thank you so much for watching Fudge Muppet. If you haven't already, please do hit that like button and subscribe if you want to help support our videos and get more role-playing content just like this. Now let's talk about what mods you're going to want so that you can have fun playing this build as soon as possible and so you understand how we're worshipping Dagon. Firstly, all seven of the mods being used are linked in the description so you can check them out for yourself. To begin with, we've got a mod called Winter Sun Faiths of Skyrim. This build will use the mod to follow Mehrun's Dagon. So as a high elf, we cannot start the game worshipping Dagon, so we actually will need to do his quest, Pieces of the Past. So the mod page says you need to complete this quest in order to be able to worship him, but for us we were able to as soon as we went into the Dawnstar Museum. Just see what works for you, but either way, you'll be doing the quest anyway. So you use a shrine to worship its deity. So once you've properly become a worshipper of Mehrun's Dagon, as far as the mod is concerned, you get a minor buff, the meditation power, and a list of his religious tenets. Dagon likes when you slay people who stand in your way, when you defile the shrines of his enemies, and when you're skilled in destruction magic. Adhering to these tenets, using the meditation power to meditate, and praying at his shrine will raise your favor with Dagon. When your favor reaches 100%, you become known as a devotee, and gain a secondary buff which acts as a dramatic manifestation of Dagon's power on Tamriel. If you ignore your duties, your favor will be lowered. So let's talk about the buffs. Firstly, there's just a general shrine blessing that makes destruction spells 10% more effective. The minor buff you get for simply being a worshipper is called self-immolation. Daedric fire burns your spirit as you meditate, draining magicka. Stop meditating at 20% or less and you'll gain more favor with Dagon, but also more burning path activations. But what in oblivion is that? Well, when you have 100% favor and become a devotee, you can get the burning path power. This makes the nearby foes burn, taking fire damage before they explode upon death for even more damage based on your favor with Mehrun's Dagon. Meditate to recharge the power. We then have the Kine Reeve Armor mod, which is used for the deadly aesthetic you see this build showing off. There's a Light Armor and Heavy Armor variant, but they look the same and we're going with the Light Armor one. Then we're using the Apocalypse Magic mod to add a whole host of new spells to the game. We then have some Fudge Muppet classic picks. There's the Imperious Races mod, Andromeda Standing Stones, the Ordinator Perk Overhaul, and the Alternate Start mod. These mods flesh out the race 
choices, the standing stone choices, all the perk trees, and provide new starts to the game so that Dagon's disciple isn't caught at the border of Skyrim with the Stormcloaks. Now let's talk about the race, standing stone, and stats. Well, Dagon's disciple is a high elf. While usually Ultima worship the Aedra, don't forget that some of their predecessors, the Oldmer, went on to split into different groups, some worshipping the Daedra. Anyways, this high elf is a well-read Daedra worshipper with some deep philosophies, and due to Imperious races, his beginning stats go like this. He'll start with 90 health, 115 magicka, and 95 stamina. He'll have 0.5% health regeneration per second, 3.75% for magicka regen, and 4.5% for stamina, and a carry weight of 250. But how about passives and abilities? Well, there's Elven Supremacy, which makes skills more effective upon reaching level 100. There's the Golden Glass Passive, which makes Magicka and Stamina regenerate faster when it's low, but at the cost of reduced armor and magic resistance. Then we have Shimmering Threads, which makes weapons and armor weaker, but enchantments stronger. Dagon's Disciple will be using some enchantments, so this is quite useful, and he doesn't use a weapon, so the only drawback is slightly weaker armor, but we can deal with that easily. Finally, there is a fourth thing, an unlockable ability called Contingency. You actually need to pluck 40 wings off butterflies to unlock it, which actually fits the alchemy aspect of the character. What it does is, at will, allow you to weave spells into an autocast trigger with specific conditions. It's not crucial to the build, so we'll let you use that strategically however you see fit. Finally, this high elf can be given any face you want, seeing as he's always wearing his hooded helmet, and during customization, we made his weight about 80% maxed. Due to his experimental nature, it could be cool to cover his face in scars behind his helmet. As for the standing stone, we're actually going with the mage stone. It's very straightforward, not overly complex, and to us it seemed so perfect for the build. With the mage stone, you'll get the power of the arcane passive. This makes all spells 10% more effective and scrolls 20% more effective. Then we have another passive called mage's path, which allows Dagon's disciple to learn all magic skills 10% faster. Perfect for an ambitious character seeking rapid intellectual expansion. Finally, we have an unlockable power which can be used once per day, simply called Ultimate Power. This lets you choose one of three random schools of magic, and then spells from this school are twice as effective and cost half as much for 60 seconds. It's the perfect thing to use before a boss battle, and we'd say being able to pick destruction would be the most optimal. As for a stat spread, Dagon's Disciple will have a changing one once he reaches a high level. To begin with, it's it's going to be two-thirds Magicka and one-third Health. This means when you're leveling up, you just pick Magicka twice and then choose Health once and then repeat. However, once he reaches 500 Magicka, you're going to want to just go all in on the Health stat to buff him up. If you ever wanted more Stamina for sprinting, simply make Restore Stamina Potions and use them when you're running. Anyways, this strategy of getting to 500 Magicka is important due to our perk choices because it actually lets us have up to four summons, which is what we want for the build. It means that when we have around five. 500 Magicka will have around 300 health and be approximately level 60. This is when you'll have your four summons, the playstyle has more or less been fully optimized, and you'll be able to go all in on health knowing that Magicka, when needed, can be restored through high level alchemy potions, which we should have plenty of at this point. Now it's time for Dagon's Disciple's backstory, his complex way of thinking and roleplaying, and his faction and quest choices. Dagon's Disciple was not always so. His devotion to Mehrun's Dagon would be a change in his later life. First, we begin with his birth in the 155th year of the Fourth Era. Dagon's future disciple was named Aradon Dereni, born in the spring on the Isle of Balfiera in the Iliac Bay. His parents were both respected and high-ranking members of the Ultima Dereni clan, and Aradon himself was a prodigy in the making. He cast his first spell at five, outperformed his peers, stunned tutors, and even developed new recipes for concoctions that are still in use today on Balfiera. These, mind you, were accomplishments made before the age of 16. He was a quick study and his brain became a library of histories and methods. As his powers and knowledge grew, so did the rising political tensions of Tamriel. His father was contracted as an expert battle mage by the Imperial Empire. The Dereni clan had long tried to remain neutral between the Old Miri Dominion and the Empire because, so far, it had served their political and economic interests to do so. But as tensions grew, they were forced to pick a side, and considering their trade opportunities surrounding them, 
and the Iliac Bay were all Empire aligned, it became a clear choice for them. At the start of the Great War, year 171, Aradon's father was called to the Imperial City and he obliged. His mother was worried for Aradon and thought it best that he be sent away, far from the potential theatre of war, to Morrowind in the northeast of Tamriel. So at age 16, the disciple was sent to live with his mother's cousin, an Ultima sorcerer named Rindal, who had married a Dunma woman of House Redoran and claimed an old Velothi tower as his home. Their first meet was quite the experience. Aradon entered the tower to find it freezing cold, with ice creeping up the walls. Rindal was meditating bare-chested and sweating desperately trying to cool down. His wife, rugged up in layers and layers of fur, greeted Aradon and explained that Rindal had been experimenting with some new potions, and that sometimes the effects were unexpected. Instantly, Aradon's ambitious mind was awash with curiosity. Over the course of the Great War, the Disciple learnt everything he could from Rindal. New methods of experimentation, new spells, histories, but most importantly, new ways of thinking. Unbeknownst to his mother, her cousin was secretly a devotee to Mehrunes Dagon. By the local Dunma, Mehrunes Dagon was considered one of the four corners of the House of Troubles, also considered a testing god. In the Dunma faith, he is one of the Daedra to be placated and overcome, but to all he is known as the Daedric Prince of Destruction, Change and Ambition. Aradon became enthralled with the stories of the Oblivion Crisis and the philosophy of the Mythic Dawn. His philosophical insights were greatly expanded, his mind almost unrecognizable from the one of years past. The Sijic Endeavor, the core philosophy of the Dunma, was something that he adopted entirely. Enlightenment through suffering, change, and challenge. To him, the true method of knowledge of enlightenment was experiment. Nothing was off the tables. Experimentation with not only spells and potions, but experimentations of the mind, pushing the limits of ethics and what he thought was possible. Five years into his tenure under Rindal, after he had greatly impressed his master, he was taken to meet Mehrunes Dagon himself, at a hidden shrine on his summoning day. He followed his master's cues as they knelt before his statue and carried out the necessary customs required to speak to him. An intense ringing began in Aradon's ears. A surging pain crept its way from the back of his neck up into the front of his head. Then, a voice. It was Dagon himself. In what felt like mere moments, he gained a wealth of understanding. Revolution, change, destruction, the true tests of growth. He would do as Dagon commanded, but not out of desire to serve, but of desire to grow. Rindal had served his purpose, but it was time for rebellion, time to test his master's strength. He hesitated for a mere moment, considering that he liked his master, but it was time to experiment and push his ethical boundaries in the pursuit of enlightenment. Aradon pulled from his cloak a potion that fortified magicka and destruction and drank it. He quickly summoned a fire atronarch as Rindal stood to realize what was going on. Outside the room, explosions and zaps of magical energy could be heard. In the end, only Aradon left the room. This was the beginning of Dagon's disciple. It is important to note that Aradon does not simply follow Mehrun's will, rather his philosophies and studies of histories, as well as his experimentations through action, have brought him to a conclusion that closely aligns with the sphere of Mehrun's Dagon, hence why it is beneficial to serve him. Aradon never returned to Balfiera. He left his past behind him. He travelled throughout a war-torn Cyrodiil connecting with Daedric cults and researching the Mythic Dawn, reading the commentaries by Mankar Cameron. For many years, he made friends, joined factions, killed friends, destroyed factions. He constantly challenged, changed, and experimented. To the layman, he may seem to be nothing more than a psychopath, but he is not devoid of emotion or empathy at all. His philosophy and practices are very cohesive and consistently applied, even if it pains him to carry out such actions such as killing his friends in order to prove he has the strength to overcome his emotional attachments. By the time you enter the shoes of Aradon, he has arrived at the College of Winterhold posing as a new student to see what he can gain from this renowned institution. For this, we are using the alternate start mod. Now let's really talk about mindset and role-playing this character. Remember that he is very fond of Mehrunes Dagon, and he respects the things that he embodies, such as ambition and destruction. He believes these things lead to lots of tests of strength, which ultimately shape stronger worlds, factions, and individuals, even if damage is caused in the process. However, while he is a follower or disciple of Dagon, his main identity is not that of being Dagon's champion. He's a worshipper, but at the end of the day, he has his own ambitions in life, which he wouldn't 
jeopardize for the desires of any Daedric Prince. His ambitions involve growing his power, largely through the acquisition of knowledge, which he likes to obtain through testing multiple hypotheses. For example, he loves alchemy, and to create the strongest potions, he knows he needs to test combinations of all different ingredients, and also ingest things himself, potentially causing himself harm, to find out how the body reacts best. Short-term risk, long-term gain, through knowledge after the experimentation. The same logic he applies to academic arcane pursuits. He would be willing to test out dangerous spells, bringing Daedra from oblivion into the mortal realm, and unleashing fire and electricity from his fingertips so that he can grow his talents as a mage. He might hurt himself or someone else, but to him it's a necessary sacrifice. Remember that not seeing the oblivion crisis with his own eyes, he might actually be a bit naive to the dangers, but it seems that this ignorance to danger actually allows him to push forth, and as you can see, benefits him greatly as he turns himself into a truly powerful being. All these tests in the pursuit of power, interestingly, align with the Dark Elf belief that Dagon is one of the testing gods of the House of Troubles. Realizing how useful testing is to acquiring knowledge and advancing one's power, Dagon's disciple will be applying this concept to many other areas. For example, how do you test the strength and power of an empire? Through a rebellion in attempt to overthrow it. He would want to know what government works best and so would be happy to help pit the Stormcloaks against the Empire, and the Empire against the Thalmor, and so on. To him, it's just like switching in and out new ingredients to create the most powerful concoction. A great way to describe his role-playing would be that he's always devil's advocate, and isn't actually ideologically swayed by any group, even if he helps them. He simply respects knowledge and power, and is constantly looking to improve things, supporting change, and by extension, destruction, if it leads to a better solution in the long run. When it comes to his views on Mundus, he kind of sees it as Lorcan's little playpen, where mortals are kept very safe from the chaotic changes and true power of Oblivion, and even kept far from the magical powers that leak through to Nern from beyond in Aetherius. This is partly why he supports Conjuration and the summoning of Daedra, and he thinks events like the Oblivion Crisis and the Plane Meld were useful tests of Nern's strength and mortality, as it was exposed to more powerful external stresses. Obviously, at the end of the day, he values growing his own power, and therefore while he pushes experiments to the limits, there are still limits and controls he'd want in place, even if others would deem his philosophies dangerous. Remember, as a worshipper of Dagon, you'll want to earn his favor through meditation, becoming good at destruction magic, slaying those who stand in your way, and defiling the shrines of his enemies. As far as factions and quests go, Dagon's disciple tends to choose the quest angle that causes challenge and experimentation, and doesn't really feel attached to the outcome. For example, he will actually side with the Stormcloaks to fight against the Empire, because he wants to see if the Empire can withstand it. Obviously, with his help, the Stormcloaks will be successful, and he knows that it was a huge help to have himself, a Dragonborn, fight alongside them, but even still, he can still be slain, and perhaps the Empire, if they're worthy of rule, should be strong enough to stop an army even if they have a Dragonborn helping. Furthermore, regardless of this, he wants to test if Skyrim would be better off with the Stormcloaks ruling, and if not, and the Empire becomes powerful again, he's happy to let them roll on through back in Skyrim and take over if they're good enough. He's not truly devoted to the Stormcloak cause. He's loyal to himself and tends to just side with others where it brings him benefit or aligns with his desire to test the strength of a certain group or person. He will do the main storyline to grow his powers as a dragonborn, testing his ability to master the Thum, and will do any quests related to alchemical learning also. He can do the Dragonborn DLC to fight off Mirak and test who is the stronger dragonborn. To increase his power, he can also work alongside Neloth and seek out the Black Books from Hermaeus Mora's realm. Just don't worship him and become his servant or anything like that. Battling the Ebony Warrior is also great, not just as a test of your own strength, but because he is suspected to be an aspect or avatar of Ebon Arm, one of Dagon's enemies. As far as the Dawnguard DLC goes, he would actually help the Dawnguard in order to test himself against the vampire threat and to further expand his skills in battle. While it may seem fitting for someone who loves to experiment to become a vampire, he is cautionary enough to not want to give up any autonomy or let Molag Bal, an undesirable master, have anything to do with his soul. You'll also obviously join the College of Winterhold to grow your magical powers, and you can end up doing the master quests too when you reach level 100 in all magic skills. It goes without saying that he'll want to do Mayrun's Dagon's quest as well, and I'm sure from the expansive role-playing concepts I've discussed, you can intuitively work out what quests go well for this build. Dagon's disciple loves progress and change, and his curiosity always wants him to see which faction or ideology comes out on top. Now
Now let's talk about skills, spells, shouts, perks, and the play style. For this build, it's going to be easiest to split skills into major and minor skills. So the three major skills are Conjuration, Alchemy, and Destruction, and we'll want to prioritize leveling these and getting perks in them first. Minor skills are less of a priority, but still help the build, especially the minor magic school skills, which we only get base proficiency in and don't add specialization. The minor skills are Light, Armor, Enchanting, Restoration, Alteration, and Illusion. You can prioritize the minor skills amongst each other as you see fit. We liked the base specialization covered across multiple bases to really fit in with the academic and intelligent brain of this character. He'll want to get 100 in each of these minor skills even though they're not priority compared to his main skills. The base perks and the magic ones are for spell efficiency only, but if you want to invest in certain magic schools and use spells from them more often, you can do so after you've got all other perks listed in the perks section. So how about the spells that he uses? Well, the end game is actually quite simple when it comes to primary spells spells. You'll be using the Conjure Dramora Honor Guard spell, which is an expert spell provided by the Apocalypse Magic mod, and then you'll have Destruction spells provided by the same mod plus vanilla ones. From the mod, Scattershock and Bombardment are great primary options, and then from vanilla, things like Chain Lightning, Fireball, Thunderbolt, and Incinerate will be dual casting most spells, so there's no strict rules about it. Before you can get the more powerful spells, you can use whichever lower tier ones you like, such as Conjure Dramora Churl or Conjure Zivilized Sword. Sorcerer. You could summon Atronox for some time, and for destruction, just stick to the less advanced fire and shock ones. We like these two elements because we feel they fit well with the themes of destruction, energy, change, and revolution. They're destructive forces. Think of volcanoes, bushfires, and storms. As for dragon shouts, we like Cyclone because it's related to a destructive force of nature also, and without mods at least, it's not something you can do with a spell. Stormcall also fits this natural destructive concept, however the problem with this is that it damages your allies, and even if you get the Companion's Insight passive from the Black Book called the Winds of Change to try to mitigate this team damage, it seems that followers will still react accordingly when damaged by Stormcall or Area of Effect spells. So if you really want to use it, you can try out the Stormwrath Lightning mod for Special Edition, which aims to make it only affect hostile NPCs. Now let's talk about perks. We're going to show you every necessary perk on screen for each skill, which you can screenshot as it comes along to refer to later, and then we'll be discussing the most important ones. So for Conjuration, the full list of perks needed can be seen on screen. Generally speaking, these perks are used to reduce casting costs, give you multiple summons, and to make these summons more powerful, last longer, and be able to be casted further away. But what's the most notable selections here? Well, Plain Meld lets you summon your Daedra five times further away, and due to Atromancy, they'll be lasting three times as long, or five times as long at night. A really important one to note is Edge of a Oblivion. This perk actually makes you lose 250 points of armor and 50% magic resistance if you don't have a Daedra summoned. Obviously, this build will always have a Daedra summoned as it's integral to the playstyle, but it's worth remembering the consequences. The plus side to this is that you can summon one more additional Daedra and they last 50% longer. Another really powerful one and another reason for always having Daedra helping is the Pact Magic perk. This makes destruction magic spells and effects 10% more effective effective for each friendly Conjured Daedra within 30 feet. In the end game, we have four Conjured Daedra, so it really takes this build's destruction to the next level. Unleash Hell is also sensational. It gives Conjured Daedra within 75 feet an additional spell they can use with a 30 second cooldown. For Dramora, it is increased attack damage and movement speed. The summon resist perk is so good, I have to mention it. It gives our Daedra within 75 feet, 50% magic resistance, and 300% points of armor. Finally, we have the March of Oblivion perk, meaning we can summon one additional Daedra per 250 points of base magicka, up to three additional minions. In the endgame stages for this build, it brings our total team of Daedra to four. It's like having your own little Daedra invasion to let loose upon your enemies. Now let's talk about Alchemy, one of the favorite talents of this build. All the perks needed can be seen on screen now. These perks tend to make your potions stronger and last longer, but let's talk about the more interesting ones. Dagon's Disciple is an avid experimenter, so with the experimenter perk, he'll be able to reveal all the effects of an ingredient just by eating it. He'll also be able to upgrade one alchemy lab to an advanced lab with the perk of the same name. Potions made here are 25% stronger, and the lab can be disassembled by sneaking. With pure mixture, all negative effects are removed from potions. You can also gain access to a host of powerful side effects after using a beneficial potion or ingredient due to both the Witchmaster and 
alchemical wedding perks. Finally, a weird one, that which does not kill you. This perk makes you drink a deadly toxin that gives you three perk points and a permanent 25% bonus to all potions you make if you can survive 60 seconds of 150 damage per second. Obviously, only choose this perk after you've stacked up a lot of restore health potions, and you'll have to just sit there bringing your health up as it rapidly drains. It's challenging, but worth it. As for destruction, all needed perks can now be seen on screen. Force of Nature is a unique one here. It makes elemental spells cost 30% less in favorable weather, and as far as this build is concerned, that means fire in sunlight and shock in the rain. The rest of the perks basically just make destruction more powerful, and we've got specialization into shock and fire, but there's nothing you really have to think about yourself as you unleash our two favorite elements. Simply put, Fire-related perks make our fire spells burn, reduce fire resistance, and even ignite targets, making them prone to additional fire detonation damage and even fleeing. Fire spells also ignite the ground under targets, causing more damage, and they can even burn corpses to cinders, which creates a burning pyre that does 50 points of damage per second for 5 seconds on contact. The shock specialization perks make our shock spells do more damage to targets the lower their magic is, and have a 15% chance to lift the target into the air for two seconds, preventing movement. Also, if the target is not fire resistant, shock spells deal five points of unresistible fire damage per second for four seconds. Shock spells will also incapacitate living targets below 25% health if they are not shock resistant. Now we have light armor. All the light armor perks can be seen on screen. As you can see, it's just the basics. These perks make our light armor more protective. We then get all these basic magic skill perks, which we'll put all on screen at once. It is just the base proficiency for enchanting, restoration, alteration, and illusion. Enchanting is probably a higher priority than the others, as it brings the most benefit just so we can have some decent enchantments across our gear. The other base mastery perks we invest into the other magic schools simply allow us to roleplay training these skills to 100 for academic pursuit and also allow us to use other types of spells when necessary even though it's not a main part of the playstyle. Remember after you get all the perks we recommend to complete the essential makeup of this build you can start adding specialization in more perks to roleplay further magical power pursuit. Now for a playstyle summary. At the start of battle unleash your four summons straight away or as many as you can muster at the time. This will wipe your magical levels out pretty fast but then you'll just simply restore immediately with Restore Magicka potions. You'll then want to add in extra skill-related potions such as Fortify Destruction. These potions, besides increasing Magicka and making Destruction spells more damaging, will increase your movement speed, kickstart Magicka and stamina regen, and cause cool side effects all due to alchemy perks. Then switch to Dual Casted Destruction Magic and smash it out as much as desired using any of the appropriate spells listed in the spells section. We've reduced Destruction cost through enchanting, and if you run out of Magicka, again just fill that bar back up with the massive amount of potions you'll be creating. Remember destruction magic is also enhanced by that packed magic perk, which relates to how many summons are near you. When using area damage spells, focus on enemies who aren't already being killed by your Dramora Honor Guard. However, the Honor Guard actually have a cloak which reduces magic resistance of enemies, so definitely hit enemies near the Honor Guard with single target magic projectiles. Cast shouts as you see fit, as instructed in the spells and shouts section. Remember to always have one summon at all times, otherwise you'll suffer some debuffs. They'll be lasting for a long time anyway. Finally, while it isn't essential, feel free to use powers from your race and standing stone, as well as from worshipping Mehrun's Dagon, that is, the Burning Path power. When it comes to gear, you'll want to be using the Light Armor variant from the mod we're using, so the full set includes Kyan Reeve Light Armor, Boots, Gauntlets, and the Hooded Helmet. You'll actually have to fight a pair of Dramora Kyan Reeve who can be encountered on the eastern edge of the Sky Temple Ruins Island. Do come prepared as the enemies are level 30. You can see where to find them on the map here. There's actually a screenshot located on the mod page you can look at. We'll also be enchanting, but only with one effect per item. Because of this, you'll want to add in a ring and necklace of your choice for more slots. As far as enchantments go, we're putting Fortify Destruction on the chest piece, helmet, and both the necklace and ring. On the gauntlet,
gauntlets, we've got Fortify Magicka to just increase our total pool. And on the boots, we're actually going with Fortify Carry Weight so that Dagon's Disciple can carry more ingredients, getting better at alchemy with more ease. It also allows him to carry more potions to either sell or very importantly, to use in battle. Speaking of potions, you'll want to be carrying lots of Restore Magicka and Restore Health potions. The Magicka ones are useful for the playstyle, so you never feel drained of magic, and the health ones are just really great, arguably overpowered, for keeping you alive. Then you'll want spells to fortify any schools of magic you desire, mainly destruction, but also conjuration if you can. Destruction potions are most useful as they increase potency, not reduce casting cost, meaning they make your spells do more damage. Conjuration potions are similar in the sense that they increase potency, that being the duration of your summons. To make fortify destruction potions, ingredients you can use include ash creep cluster, beehive husk, ectoplasm, glow dust, glowing mushroom, nightshade, and wisp wrappings. For fortify conjuration potions, ingredients include ancestor moth wing, blue butterfly wing, blue mountain flower, bone meal, chorus hunter antennae, frost salts, hag raven feathers, and lavender. Potions for utility like water breathing can also be carried, as can fortify carry weight potions if you're ever needing to haul more loot than otherwise possible. Finally, you'll be getting your hands on Mayrune's razor by doing Dagon's quest, and you can carry it just for the sake of having the artifact, but you'll hardly need it, so do as you wish with it. Perhaps you'd want to store it somewhere. And that wraps up another modded Skyrim build, Dagon's Disciple. I hope you all thoroughly enjoyed the video, and remember, if you do want more builds, be sure to let us know in the comments, and please do like the video if you want to support our content. Social media links are in the description, along with a link to our Patreon, and with timestamps so you can go back and rewatch parts of the build you might have missed. Thank you so much for watching Fudge Muppet, we all greatly appreciate your support. My name is Michael, and I look forward to nerding out with you again very soon.